Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what's happening outside this hotel room, what's happening offline in some ways, what's happening in the heads of the 7.6 billion people and rising, it's probably more than that now, on this planet, who constitute the matrix, the, the background within which all of you operate, which is society, essentially. Now, I think I'm not here to convince you that corporate social responsibility is a good thing. All of you, every single one of you in this room, I'm sure, are excellent, uh, decent corporate citizens. No matter what type of business you have, whether you're online enabling uh, two deaf people to talk to each other, whether you're selling uh, autonomous vehicles that will redefine the concept of what it means to be an old or a disabled person uh, in terms of mobility, uh, whether you're a social media firm that allows uh, people who may be pathologically shy to actually express themselves and communicate, all of you, or the, just the local greengrocer around the corner selling fruit to your local community, all of you are interacting with society and with the community around you. And so it goes without saying that you are all corporate citizens in one way or another. Your staff are part of society. Your neighbors that you go home to and your family are part of society. But the idea, what I'm here today to do is to see how can we actually measure that impact that we have, whether we like it or not, on society. A lot of people take a very traditional approach, and I'd like to focus on this picture for a few more seconds, to corporate social responsibility, the charity approach, let's say. Now, corporate social responsibility in the wrong hands, if you don't actually have a theory of what you're trying to do, of the social change that you're trying to effect, can actually be quite dangerous. Um, I'll give you a very quick example. In Kenya, one company decided that they would, as part of their corporate social responsibility efforts, provide free mosquito nets for everyone, um, which would, obviously, it's a malaria zone, it's, it's, it's probably a good idea, but they didn't really think it through. In Kenya, there were lots of local uh, self-employed people who were converting fishing nets into mosquito nets, who were using their, their, their tailoring skills to build their own. There was an emerging local small-scale industry of people employing local people who are actually uh, selling very cheap um, mosquito nets to their local communities. Then there was this influx of free mosquito nets for everyone. Well, all these guys went out of business. And then the company's CSR project ended. They went home. And there was no local capacity anymore. Nobody, all these people who actually could have provided a local uh, stable uh, uh, provision of these nets had gone. So you need to have a theory of what it is you're trying to do. What is, it, what is the change that you're trying to affect in society? Are you trying to address one of these big social challenges, one of the big sustainable development goals? Or in a more modest way, are you trying to uh, uh, fix a problem with drugs in your local uh, community around the corner? And more importantly, how do you measure if you've actually succeeded or not? So a lot of businesses will do surveys, polls, uh, the classic uh, approach, or um, the, the passive collecting of data, the Facebook approach, where, as we've mentioned a lot today, there is huge amounts of data about what people buy, what they say. But here's the problem. You're actually, um, we're not analyzing this data. We're not milking this data for what it's worth, that's the first problem. We may, you know, you come up, you'll do a poll of your, see if your customers are satisfied, you'll get a couple of bar charts. Most cases, you won't even know if the differences that you see between different groups of customers are actually statistically meaningful, or if they're just due to the fact that you only interviewed 30 people and it's a pure coincidence. Or you may notice a trend, you'll get a nice line with the best fit of all your data, and it turned, you, you will assume cause and effect, whereas in fact, this trend is actually caused by a third factor that you haven't even measured, that happens to be related to what you're measuring. So you can do a graph about anything. There's a graph here about percentage of the chart which looks like Pac-Man, and the percentage of the chart that doesn't. This is not enough. This doesn't tell you anything. What you need to do if you want to measure impact is actually look at this matrix in which you exist, which is society at all the millions of possible factors to pull out the three or four drivers that will actually make your social responsibility strategy a success given what, how society thinks and how it behaves. Now, 
online, people have a personality. So Facebook is collecting all this data in Cambridge Analytica, you know, uh, managed to <laughs> somehow get hold of it. But how if, how, what, what does it actually tell us about people? When you're on Facebook, at least myself, what, what you have there is an avatar. It's not you. You're usually trying to present yourself. You're competing with all your friends to see who is the happiest, who's got the nicest, most beautiful family. But that's not you. That's not what you're actually thinking. And when you go to the polls and vote, or when you go and act to the streets and start smashing shop windows because you're angry, nobody had predicted it because they're looking at your online persona, which is really, a, it's a fiction. It's not you. So what we're interested in today is how do you go inside society? And we have a set of tools that are used, have been used in social research and to a certain extent in market research for 20 or 30 years, but nobody's really leveraged the full potential. It's called structural equation modeling. It's to get us away from the Pac-Man charts and to actually look at the interconnections within society and to come up with a theory of what you want to do. Is it you want to solve the Cyprus problem? Do you want to uh, reduce the amount of gun violence in Venezuela? Whatever. It doesn't matter. You're there on the left. You want to go to a specific result that maybe will make the resulting environment society more stable and more conducive to business. But in between, you've got this big black box that's called society. It's people, essentially. And people don't behave the same way as individuals and in groups. And that's another big problem. And you're trying to understand what's happening inside that box. It looks like a straight line, but it's not. In there, it's a spaghetti mess of little lines going all over the place, and you've got to find your way out from there to there. Ooh, is anybody getting worried that I was invited here today? No. <laughs> this is a structural equation model. It may look complicated at first, but actually, it's really quite simple. You'll notice that all there is here are square rectangles, circles, and ovals. That's it. Usually, your end result, what you want to measure, is one of the ovals, big ovals here. So here we're looking, for example, at the, at the Cyprus peace process. So the idea is we want to get to a level where societies on both sides, let's say, are ready for coexistence. That's what you want to achieve. Okay? It's an example. It could be anything else. It could be people being more environmentally conscious. It doesn't really matter. Now, you can't actually measure that. You can't go out to people and say, hey, do you want a solution to the Cyprus problem? Most people will say yes. But when you ask the deeper questions, you will realize that actually they don't want to live together. If you ask them, oh, well, but yeah, but would you like your daughter to marry, you know, somebody from the, oh, no, actually I wouldn't. Well, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, but we want a solution. So these are called latent variables. These are m variables you can't actually measure. You can't go out there and ask a question and get an answer. These variables are composed of indicators. These are questions you can ask people in a survey. So for example, frequency of contact. How often uh, do you have coffee with a Turkish Cypriot? Uh, do, do you support, yes or no, a binary question, the bicommunal, bizonal federation? Uh, do, do you, uh, what's the quality of this contact on the scale of one to 10? So these are things you can measure. These are your indicators, which make up your actual outcome variable. And here, essentially, you have little numbers, and they don't really matter what they are, but each one of those different factors in people's minds, whether it's the behavioral factors or uh, attitude factors, has a different level of influence on the final answer. So it may be that, the, that contact, physical contact with people from the other side is actually much more important as a predictor of people's readiness for coexistence than uh, people's political affiliation, for example. And then you work your way backwards. There are all sorts of factors, demographic factors in society, being a man, being a woman, being young, being old, all this will affect the end result. So these are not components of your, of your outcome. These are, not, these are not what your outcome variable is made of. These are the, the essentially social predictors. And within those, they all interact with each other. So if people feel insecure, if there's low levels of human security, people then tend to have more social distance with groups that they consider to be different. Uh, so if people are better off, if they're satisfied with the public services that are being offered, then they will have less anxiety about other groups. And then uh, public life satisfaction is actually linked to human security. So all these factors are interacting with each other, and then they're producing a result 
which is whether or not people are ready, in this case, for coexistence. And so your idea is you start somewhere here, and you see what you can put into the system, no, knowing, understanding, all these little points here are how strong are these interactions between the different factors. And you draw the path of least resistance, essentially, which will allow you to get to where you want uh, by working with the right groups in society. So it may be that uh, you've been preaching to the converted all along, and in fact what you need to do is you need to go down to Paphos, where people maybe are more resistant to this idea of change. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't be about his process, it could be about anything. And then you work with people there. But then within Paphos, what's the real problem? It turns out that, oh, well, they're a bit further away from the buffer zone, so actually it's, a, it's an issue with contact. Okay, so the type of activities you could then work on are uh, activities that promote contact. I mean, these are just examples, but all of this data can be gathered through simple surveys. But it's the way you do these surveys which is different, in the sense that you work your way back from a possible end result, and you come up with a theory, and then you develop your questions in your survey to try and either prove or disprove that theory. So you, you go there with an open mind, but you need to have a theory. You don't just go out there and collect millions of uh, terabytes of data and then see what the data is telling you. You have a theory. This is the human element, and you can't get rid of this. Um, of course, there are problems because structural equation modeling, to a certain degree, requires an amount of statistical knowledge. So for a small, you know, SME, it, it may not be worth it. But for a larger company or a group of small companies that have the same interests, um, it may be worth pooling resources and actually trying to develop a model and then tweaking just some of the parameters of that model just based on the interests uh, that, that you're interested in. Um, also, structural equation modeling, again, you can't, we talked earlier about artificial intelligence. You can't remove humans out of these processes. It requires a certain amount of subjective judgment. You have a theory. And that theory is based on either your personal knowledge of the society around you or on focus group discussions, consultations with society to try and understand what are the actual real social problems uh, that need to be uh, addressed and what could be the possible obstacles within society to that. Um, so it's, it's quite a simple procedure, essentially. You, well, once you, you, you've, you've got someone on board who can actually do the statistics, and most of it is actually uh, based on rather advanced software, you design your model by consulting with groups that represent the society at large, you define your questions, and then you go out and do your survey uh, based on the questions that you developed together with the social stakeholders. Then you try and validate your model, and if you find that the data doesn't match your theory, uh, if you find that your intended outcome uh, just it, it cannot be reached that way, then you have to th rethink your whole theory of change. You have to think, okay, what can we do given the social context that we're working on? And then you have to try and visualize the results because nobody will want to see uh, what I showed you earlier. Nobody will want to see this, policymakers or the general public. So what you have to do is then try and visualize, show your, your results in a visual manner. So for example, here we're talking before about the Cyprus peace process. We broke it down by areas uh, where data was collected on a scale of 1 to 10, and it just shows on the geographical point of view, for example, where there are hot spots where maybe intervention uh, may be more uh, important than others. And then you can do all sorts of infographics uh, like that. But at the end of the day, it's up to you. Whatever theory of change you have in mind, whatever strategy you have in mind, you start with your end result, you then try and understand what it's made of, so what kind of questions you can ask people that will make it happen, and then based on, on the actual analysis of all these interacting factors, you find your path of least resistance of how to get from A to B. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Yeah. Yes.